Welcome, everyone. My name is Veronica Chambers, and I'm the editor of Narrative Projects at The New York Times. I'm excited to be here with you live from London, and I'm joined by my brilliant colleague, Charlie. Hey, everybody. My name is Charlie brinkhouse Cuff. I am the senior editor on the Black History Continued Project, and I couldn't be more proud of the work we have produced this year so far, but there is more to come. Um, I think my favorite, like, Thing so far that I've had the pleasure of working on is the foraging story. Um, it was just so wonderful to understand more about how foraging gives people the ability to find freedom in the great outdoors. I know. I love the foraging story. And I also loved our surfing piece. I think what Diane Cardwell, Joshua Kissy, and Morgan Masson created together was so incredible. I mean, if you Google black surfers, there's a lot of pictures of people holding boards but we were in the water with them, under the water, in the waves. And it just, I literally watched the videos again and again and again. Yeah, I think it made all of us want to try surfing again, which was not something that I thought I would want to do <laughs> in the future. Um, but yes, if you want to find out more about the project, please go to nytimes.com slash BHC. You can find past events. You can find all of our brilliant articles and interactive projects right there a lot of inspiration. So today we're here to share episode three of the series, and we're extremely thrilled to join this global community and explore how black folks experience the great outdoors. We're taking a deeper look at the multifaceted perspectives of black discovery and wonder in nature. We're gonna debunk some stereotypes around the experiences of nature in the black community and turn a lens on lesser known activities and lifestyles. We're encouraged that this program will also remind you that like Alice Walker wrote, nothing in nature is perfect and everything is perfect. You don't have to do anything fantastic or adventurous to be outdoorsy, just being outside is perfect. In this episode, we will take you outside. Then we'll head to the waves with Vans global surf athlete and founder of Textured Waves, Chelsea Woody. Celebrated educator, historian, and author Blair Mani will help us get smarter around the stereotypes and perceptions of what Black people don't do when it comes to outdoor recreation. Hint, there's nothing we don't do. And next, Charlie will have the pleasure of leading a live panel conversation where you get to ask questions of some of our favorite people. Chef, author, and publisher Bryant Terry, culinary creative and writer, Rahana Bissaret Martinez, and forager and outdoor educator, Alexis Nicole Nelson. And we're gonna dive into why fresh food is so powerful. So get your questions ready with a poetic invocation by poet and artist, Precious Okuyaman. And then we'll close with a moving and powerful performance by artist, activist, entrepreneur, Mumu Fresh. Um, together, they are, and we are, Black and Bloom. I really don't care what anybody thinks of how I look on a wave. I'm just communicating with the wave. It's like this symbiotic relationship of the wave pushing me or propelling me down its surface and me carving on the wave however my body decides to do that. It's like a dance. Like a lot of African-American female surfers, my... Um, my relationship with water was very closely tied to my 
relationship with my own natural self, my natural hair. I learned to embrace the water and what it would do for me and how it like allowed me to bloom. When you're out there, you just have this joy. It's overpowering and it, it makes you forget everything that's happening in the world. We place ourselves in these really confined boxes of how we can be presented to the world. And I think it's time to break out of those boxes. You know, when we add ourselves to the equation and to the mix, we always bring our own flavor. Watch out, surf world. Surf culture has been so insular for like the last 70 years, especially here in the States. I mean, the more Black female groms and Black groms that are in this space, it's going to be beautiful because we always bring our magic. We always do. Next up is critically acclaimed author Blair Amani, whose work focuses on women, global black communities, and LGBTQ plus folks. I'm also really excited because I'm a big fan of her series, Smarter in Seconds on Instagram, which has amassed over 50 million views. So let's get smarter about black recreation with Blair Amani. heard stereotypes about what black people don't do when it comes to outdoor recreation. Allegedly, black people don't swim, we don't ski, we don't hike. Well, it's time to get smarter with me, Blair Armani. Let's debunk and demystify all the things that black people don't do when it comes to outdoor recreation. As a black person in the United States, my relationship to this land is, well, complicated. Historically, black people have been associated more with outdoor labor than outdoor recreation and leisure. And yes, it's a fact that we lack visibility and representation in outdoor activities. But to get smarter about this, we need some important historical context. It's a lot easier to say black people don't than to admit that black people have been systematically prevented from. Black people have been denied so much in the United States from bodily autonomy and agency to leisure time, personal time and recreation time. And a key feature of white supremacy is denying access to public spaces to everybody but white people and then deciding what racialized people can do and where we can go when we enter those realms. And despite attempts to keep the great outdoors a white only domain, Black folks are out here, and in some cases, we've been doing so for a long time and a good time. Case in point, camping. Yes, black people hike through the woods, set up tents for shelter, and sleep in remote locations for fun. Take Lewis Mountain at the Shenandoah National Park, which opened as a segregated camping facility in 1939. Black folks would go out to enjoy nature, be in the woods, be with family, enjoy the campgrounds, the cabins, and the lodges. When national parks were created, they were segregated, and they were not desegregated officially until 1945, and that was only on paper. It's hard to have a long family tradition of hiking and going out to national parks when our elders' memories of those campgrounds came with for whites only signage. Yet black folks are known to make a way out of no way. From the early to mid 1900s, black children would go to summer camps like Camp Atwater in Massachusetts and Camp Mueller at the Cuyahoga Valley National Park to enjoy leisure time, spend time together, and to get away from the city. Black families would venture to places like Martha's Vineyard and Sag Harbor near the Hamptons. And in many cases, we still do, spending time near and on the water, working, playing, resting, and building community. Of course, those enclaves of black recreation and leisure are still affected by policies like redlining, gentrification, and policing, which erode at the foundation. Despite attempts to keep the black community down and out of nature, we still out here. Black folks enjoy camping, backpacking, hiking, and as we gain more access to outdoor spaces, we also find comfort in solidarity groups like Outdoor Afro and the Black Outdoors. Next up, Adventure sports, yes, black folks participate in adventure and extreme sports like mountaineering, ice climbing, and more snow sports, but it's not a recent development. Take for example, Matthew Henson, a black man born to sharecroppers in 1866, who made history as a trailblazer in Arctic exploration. And black folks are still following in his footsteps, braving the snow and frigid temperatures in pursuit of adventure. 
Folks like Charles Crenshaw and Sophia Dannenberg are climbing some of the world's highest mountains, and rock climbers like Manoa Ainuo are scaling ice walls, doing so seeking freedom, joy, and adrenaline. Black folks also skydive and base jump. Take Team Black Star, an organization that advocates for black skydivers, part of the long and storied history of black aviators and black paratroopers. Finally, there are myths about black people and our aversion to water and our inability to swim. Yes, black people can and do swim and participate in water sports. The black American relationship to water has been impacted by historical trauma through things like intimidation, segregation, policing, and white terrorism at pools throughout the 1900s. As a community, we are working to heal from this, and our leaders are doing this as well. Take, for example, Cullen Jones, a black Olympic medalist who's from New York and won an Olympic gold medal in swimming in 2008. Now that he's retired from competitive sports, he's working to make swimming more diverse and more inclusive. In addition to swimming, there's water sports like surfing, which is historically an indigenous practice. In the book Afro Surf, the surf company Mamiwata talks about how it's not just something that exploded in white communities in the past few decades, but there's a long history of African surfers in places like Mozambique, Morocco, Somalia, and South Africa. While surfing didn't take off in the same way in black American communities as it did in white American communities, this is because some of the barriers I mentioned earlier and because of the racist and unwelcoming nature of white American surf culture. Like activists and organizers that organized wade-ins between the 50s and 60s, there are organizations working today, like Color the Water and Black Girl Surf, working to make the beach somewhere where black folks can exist, thrive, and ride the waves. A lot of U.S. history has involved controlling the outdoors and who has access to it, so black folks' interest and ability to be outdoors is informed by all of this historical context, as well as a lack of safety, access, resources, and support. But guess what? Black folks are outside. We are enjoying nature, from newbies to casual enthusiasts, to adventurers, to adrenaline seekers. We are outdoors, and we deserve to be. We deserve to have access to anywhere we want to go. As we work to reestablish and redefine our connection to nature, what we don't need is racist narratives about what black people don't do to overshadow what we have done, what we are doing, and what's yet to come for us. We must remember that the perceptions about the limitations of black people never match the reality of what we are actually capable of doing. Thank you so much for taking the time to get smarter with me, Blair Imani. I hope that you check out my new book, Read this to get smarter about race, class, gender, disability, and more. Until then, I'll see you outdoors. Access to fresh and good food has never been more important. In our next segment, we're excited to have a live conversation with some of the most celebrated voices in the food space. We're gonna be talking to a young chef, Rahana Bissaret Martinez, forager, Alexis Nicole Nelson, and chef and really food legend, Bryant Terry. Remember, you can tweet along with the program by using the hashtag Black History Continued. And please add your questions to the chat so we can grab them. Hello, everyone. Once again, I am Charlie Brinkhouse-Cuff, and thank you so much for staying with us. This is a live panel discussion exploring another angle of the great outdoors, food, my favorite angle. Um, particularly today, we're going to be talking about farming, foraging, veganism, and food justice, if we have time. Uh, I'm thrilled to be joined by three esteemed pa panelists, Alexis Nicole Nelson, who's a creator sharing her knowledge and passion for foraging and outdoor education. She uses her channel to detail how foraging is important to her culture, as well as simple tips and tricks for finding edible plants and cooking what she finds, all with a lighthearted and comedic lens. Please welcome Alexis. Hello, and thank you so much for having me, Charlie. I'm so excited to be here. Me too. You've been such an inspiration this pandemic year. Um, next up, we have Bryant Terry, who is a James Beard and NAACP Image Award winning chef, educator, publisher and author, renowned for his activism to create a healthy, just and sustainable food system. His forthcoming collection of recipes, art and stories entitled Black Food will be released by his publishing imprint, 
four color books and 10 speed press this October. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Amazing. I cannot wait to see your book in the flesh as we were discussing just before we went live. Um, and last but not least, we have Rahana Bissaret Martinez, a culinary. Work appears in Teen Vogue, Food and Wine, and Bryant curated black food book, as we just discussed. And her first cookbook, Flavorous, which is a great name, by the way. I need to ask you about that at some Thank point. <laughs> is expected in 2023. Welcome, Rahana. Thank you. So excited. Amazing. We're also joined by the esteemed Rory Burton, who is our fantastic American Sign Language interpreter. Thank you so much, Rory, for all your work. Um, everyone will have a chance to ask questions later, but now is my time. I get to ask the questions. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to kick off tonight's event with asking the big question, I guess, and I'm going to direct it to you first, Brian. Uh, obviously, tonight has been all about how black folks experience the great outdoors. And I wanted to know for you, what does the words nature is our right mean, I guess, in the context of black food exploration specifically? Yeah, thank you, Charlie. That's a great question. And it takes me back to a quote that I read last week in which um, some activists, and I can't remember um, who the person was, talked about uh, both the stereotypes and the reality of many Black people having a reluctance to um, be in um, natural environments, going hiking or, you know, being in the forest or even this... Um, you know, real and imagined way in which people imagine Black folks not being able to swim or having this reluctance when it comes to water. And what they said, I think, was pretty brilliant and profound. And he, he said that, you know, these stereotypes, these realities say more about white violence than they do mm -hmm. about the interest, the excitement, enthusiasm, or competency of Black people. And I think it's important to recognize that, um, you know, contemporary and historical white violence has robbed many Black people of the basic human right of being able to just enjoy the natural environment without the anxiety and concern of white violence. And we, we've seen this often with the proverbial, uh, you know, recordings of the proverbial Karens disrupting Black folks when they're just living their best life. You know, I think about um, one of the the more recent um, prominent examples was uh, the bird watcher, uh, Chris Cooper um, in New York City when he was in Central Park and got into this confrontation with this white woman and she called the police and was making up all these things. And we've seen um, countless examples of that in the urban environment, but these are the, the same type of white violence is happening in rural spaces. Um, I think about this um, place in Northern California, um, Nevada City, it's a small town. And you know, it's an interesting place because there are a lot of, um, artists from California. I think it has the highest density per capita of artists in California there, a lot of hippies. But then there are like areas where there are white separatists there. And a lot of people come from the city and go up there because there's a Yuba River and people love to get away and, and um, go up and just enjoy the natural environment. And a couple, and so we have a um, home up there. And so we spend a lot of time up there in the summer. Mm -hmm. And I remember a couple of years ago, there was an incident where there was um, some drunk white men who attacked this black family who had to come up to just go um, hiking and camping with their family. And it was, you know, so dramatic that uh, one of the men had, uh, you know, just kind of run towards the 83 year old grandmother and knocked her down. And it was a big deal. And it kind of, you know, a lot of people in the community were talking about it. And I don't, you know, it makes me anxious and makes me fearful of being outside and being at a river and just having to be on alert when this is the, the moment where you should be the most relaxed. This is the, mm. you know, doing something like enjoying, you know, the, the river or going on a hike. These are the times where a lot of people talk about finding respite from the cha chaotic mm. nature of the world. And so I think that um, just like clean air, untainted water and nutrient rich food, uh, the, the, the ability to go out into the natural environment and enjoy without having our cortisol raised, without the, the anxiety of uh, the, the potential of white violence is a human right that we should all be afforded. 
Absolutely. Um, Alexis, I could see you sort of nodding along there, especially when Bryant was describing some of those incidents of, of white violence. Um, I know it's something that you've spoken a little bit about before and even in the feature that we worked on together. Um, do you, what is your sort of conception of that and how do you sort of find respite, you know, perhaps despite that or amongst that? Well, I think especially after the last year, 18 months, that we've all had, it's become readily apparent how much being able to spend time outside is not just good for us physically, it's also good for us mentally. It's good for us emotionally. You know, it's one of those things that I think really helps a person reset when stress levels are at an all-time high. So the fact that we as a group have been kind of systemically left out of a lot of those outdoor spaces and kind of made to feel for a lot of generations like those spaces did not belong to us as much as they belong to others. Like it's caused a gap in terms of like mental wellness, in terms of physical wellness uh, between the black community and the white community. And that's something that we're like everyone in this chat right now is actively working to break down because part of the issue that I think has held back our parents, our grandparents is if you don't see other people who look like you doing it, the kind of inertia that keeps you from doing it is so much greater than it would be otherwise. Uh, so for me, nature is a right is just like kind of a mantra that we have to keep repeating to ourselves that we have to keep repeating to people younger than us so we can kind of pass this baton on to them because i feel like for the last couple of generations a lot of people have been grinding to break down some of those stereotypes and i feel like the floodgates are about to open uh and we just got to keep opening them <laughs> yeah for sure i love that and yeah i think Keeping it as a mantra is a beautiful way of, um, of of capturing what I hope people take away from from this panel as well. You know, if you remember one thing, nature is our right because it is. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Rahana, I wanted to move on to speak to you more specifically about food because you know food is your your one true love. I'm sure. Yeah. I hope I'm not overstepping to say that. Um, and I know that every time that you sort of set the table with, with the produce that you get from the farmer's market, which is intrinsically tied to this wider conversation about outdoors, I know that you're sort of trying to tell a story. So I was wondering, like, we were talking just before we started about the, the blackberry chesleches cake that you've been making. And I've seen you posting all these amazing <laughs> recipes and, and, and all sorts, and you're working on your new cookbook. Um, but what are the stories that you're trying to tell at the moment through your food? Yeah, I think I'm trying to tell a, a variety of stories through my food. I feel like uh, I've been thankful and grateful to have a kind of diverse uh, agricultural environment in here in Northern California. And I really just want to highlight um, these family farms and the agriculture and um, just trying to shop in our communities and just like explore the environment and really celebrate it with my food. And I hope my book is a celebration of not just agriculture in California, but kind of all over. Amazing. And um, can you tell us about the title? Why, why Flavorous? I, I'm so curious to know. Yeah, Flavorous um, means pleasant taste. And I really wanted to go with that um, title because as soon as I heard it, I was like, that's got to be it. I feel like so many different cultures or food are known for being super flavorful and delicious, especially black food. <laughs> and so I feel like it really kind of puts it essentially together as like, this is what you'll get with the book. And I hope it brings people in to explore and like flip the pages. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to be like literally cooking every single thing, <laughs> telling you. everyone about this brand new word that I found flavorous. <laughs> like, it's, yeah, it's beautiful. Um, but on the mention of farming, I think it's a, it's a good segue for us to talk a bit about black farming. Um, and just, I guess, they've had a struggle over the years, right, for survival and visibility. I think I read a stat that, like, the amount of land ownership that, you know, that black people have had in terms of using it for farming has gone way down in the past few years. Um, and I wanted to know from all of you, are there any sort of farmers or purveyors in the food space that you're super excited about? Um, there's a few that I've got in mind, but I, I wonder if there's some new ones you guys can throw out there. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Brian. 
Sure. Uh, the two that come to mind immediately are uh, two friends, and um, one is actually a mentee. And I'll start with him, and his name is uh, Etef, also known as DJ Kavum. And he's a Denver-based farmer, chef, uh, food justice activist, uh, DJ, MC. He's just a polymath, a brilliant young guy. But he's been doing such uh, important work in Denver in terms of uh, really understanding like the creative ways, or, or I, I guess I should say, kind of inventing and 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 pioneering these creative ways to empower the most historically um, uh, impacted communities. Uh, you know, we talk a lot th about this idea of food justice, which is uh, addressing what we now are talking about as food apartheid. I think you know, over the past several decades, the term that's been in co common parlance in terms of looking at communities that have very little access to healthy, fresh, affordable, and culturally appropriate food has been food deserts. And that term has been largely supplanted by a lot of uh, food justice activists and, and people um, who are far left uh, social justice activists who um, have understand that the term food apartheid uh, more squarely helps us understand the structural barriers that prevent many communities from accessing healthy, fresh, affordable, and culturally appropriate food. And I would argue that uh, one of the cornerstones of food justice is that the solutions are owned and driven by the people most impacted mm -hmm. by these issues. You know, we've seen countless examples of this kind of paternalistic approach that we, um, you know, often see coming from philanthropic organizations or um, NGOs that are working in these, you know, struggling communities. And so often, um, you know, the, the money that's coming in is going to like these snow capped organizations and being paid for staff and the money isn't actually making an impact in the community in the way that it should. And, and that says to me that one, people don't recognize that the folks living in communities, they understand the problems, they understand the issues, and they have a lot of brilliant and creative solutions, but what people need are resources. They need power shifted into their hands so that they can actually own and drive these solutions, and ETEF has been important in doing that. The other person, Leah Penniman, who is a um, chef um, outside of Buffalo, um, her farm, the work that she's doing in her, um, fire i'm i'm blanking on the name right now but leah penniman is this brilliant um you know chef and activist who has you know understood the role that um these rural spaces can play in educating consumers and empowering people living in cities to actually come and gain skills that they could then bring back to their communities but also as we spoke about earlier and as alexis bro uh, mentioned giving people a space where they can actually leave the city and feel safe and feel like they see each other see other people who look like them and um are working towards a goal for collective empowerment and self-determination Amazing. I think that point on resources is so crucial. Um, because as I kind of mentioned earlier, I think that's one of the things that I've certainly read about that a lot of black farmers or, or black people working in, in the food justice space have struggled with is sustainability or sustaining their practice through uh, because of resource. Um, Alexis, how do you think that um, you know, the conversation around foraging and, and specifically specifically black people in the foraging space can can play into food justice? Um, how big a role can foraging, you know, practically play as, as we kind of look for solutions to this? Yeah, talking about practicality is always like really important when it comes <laughs> to foraging. Um, Cause I'm like the last person who will tell someone, oh, the way that we are going to fix these food deserts, these food disparities, this food apartheid mm -hmm. is definitely through everyone just eating acorns. Cause like, that's not, that's not the way that we're going to fix the problem. It's like a tiny puzzle piece and like a 2000 part jigsaw puzzle that simultaneously is made up of like members of our community actually coming up with solutions and being given the ability to come up with the solutions to these problems. I think foraging is really important for a myriad of reasons. If I say it's not important, then it's like, Oh, there goes my entire stick out the window. <laughs> but one of the things that I think it does for anyone who isn't planning on making it a huge portion of their diet is it opens your eyes up to a lot more food possibilities. Um, it opens your eyes up to being more creative in the kitchen and to implementing a whole lot more leafy greens and veggies and, and nuts and fruits into your diet that you maybe wouldn't have thought about doing otherwise. 
And it doesn't hurt that some of those things you're bringing into your diet are things that you can access for free. And for a lot of us, it's like growing in our neighborhoods. Urban foraging, I think, doesn't get uh, enough time in the limelight. Everyone thinks you have to go deep into the forest um, or know someone who owns a huge swath of land. And you have to have all of the mushrooming gear and the tiny knives <laughs> and the field guides. When sometimes it's like, no, man, like our neighborhood is covered in lamb's quarters right now. Instead of going to the grocery store and buying that huge tub of spinach, let's go for a walk and gather some together and let that be a part of your meal instead. It's a very small piece of the food access puzzle. Um, but I think it's an important one. And it's one that we haven't really touched on until very recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. Um, and Char Charlie, yeah. can, can oh, I yeah. just, I just wanted to That's follow great. and I agree with everything Alexa said. And I just want to say that um, I think that foraging is um, a, a radical act, especially mm -hmm. given what we were uh, discussing earlier in terms of black folks just taking up space, mm -hmm. you know, in our communities, you know, in, in communities where, especially when you have urban centers that are being gentrified, and then folks are looking at you like, what are you doing here? You know, I was reading a story about this six, this man who had been living in um, uh, Fort Greene for 60 years, this um, black man, and he said he had gone over to speak to one of his white neighbors, and then they were like, oh, I don't have any money. And he said, you know, he's like, I'm just coming to introduce myself. I've lived here for six decades. And, you know, one thing I had to confront early is this feeling like, well, is, is cooking political or is, you know, um, gathering at meals political? And I think in an industrialized food system that's largely controlled by a handful of multinational corporations, foraging, making food from scratch, gathering people around the table to cook are um, highly political, dare I say radical, in a food system that wants you to, you know, buy a lot of fast food or get your all your food from a corporate um, run supermarket or to stuff your face over the sink before you're going to one low paid job to the next one. So I, I think Alexis is right in that these are systemic problems, but I, I just want to emphasize that these small acts of radical resistance are, um, I think, equally important to things that we might imagine as like, you know, bigger important ways that we can address these problems. Absolutely. So much food agency has been taken from us over the last like multiple centuries, but especially with this globalization and industrialization of our food systems. So anything that you can do, even if it's just growing a couple ears of corn in your backyard, growing your herbs in your little window pot like my mom always <laughs> used to when I was growing up. They're all, uh, they're all tiny radical acts. They're all little bits that you're taking agency over what goes into you and your family's bodies. And that's beautiful. Yeah, 100%. Um, I was just thinking back to when me and my mom used to go foraging for blackberries in a local cemetery near us. And I would just never, it was like filled with bats and it was really creepy. And I would have never, <laughs> you know, if she, hadn't, if she hadn't taken me there, I would have never known that there could have been like a food source there, you know? Um, and it is so, it, it is definitely part of the puzzle, as you put it, Brian. Um, Rahana, this is my last question for you guys. I'm really sad I could have spoken to you for hours, but we're going to move on to the audience in a sec. But I wanted to end with you. Obviously, you know, you are the next generation. You're coming up. You've got your cookbook coming out. We're so excited to read it and continue to support you. Um, but I mean, what do you hope to bring to the, the food world? I know that you've spoken in the past like beautifully about the importance of more black led and black run food media, for instance. Um, what do you think you can sort of bring as a, as a young black person just making your first step into the industry? Yeah, I feel like as a young black person, I have a, a bit of a responsibility to really uh, act on what I talk about and support other people and include that in anything that I put out. And I think that a lot of people my age really look towards um, older people and also uh, just other people in general to kind of guide us towards um, the future of sustainability and um, just together as a community. And I feel like um, I'm really excited to keep cooking with um, black owned brands, black owned businesses and going to the farmer's market and seek out um, black farmers. And so I think I hope that I can continue that and in my book kind of highlight that as well. My cookbook. 
gorgeous. Thank you so much. Okay, so just a reminder to our lovely audience, please add your questions to the chat so we can see them. You can also tweet them at hashtag Black History Continued. Um, and I'm just gonna take a little look. So Creativity Rocks asks, speaking as a city girl, actually a senior who's never camped out, but who loves the outside at night, I have a desire to try camping. What's the best way to ease into the outdoor experience? Has anyone got any experience with camping? Oh, I love camping. <laughs> I love right. camping. My suggestion, especially if you are in a city, is to find a group of like-minded people to go camping with. Here in Columbus, Ohio, we have a wonderful organization called Black Girls Camp. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's nationwide now, and you find your little cohort, and a couple times during each season, even the winter time, for all of you folks who are braver and warmer than me, uh, <laughs> people will go out together and have these group camps and for me, the best way to learn is by going and doing something with someone who knows better than you and has been doing it for longer. And it's great because you also get to foster some community while you're at it too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, camping is wonderful. Definitely get out there if you're even the littlest bit interested and try it and mm -hmm. see how you feel <laughs> about it. I wanna, well, I wanna offer oh, it. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Rana. I was just gonna ask if you'd ever been camping before, Rana. Yeah, I love camping so much. Um, I've been camping with my family before, and I think um, to really get out there and have fun is to, you know, be prepared and look for other things in the wild. I remember one time we were camping and um, there was a whole fig tree. And so that was really exciting to be able to, like, take that <laughs> off the tree and eat and just, like, have fun. And I think as long as you're with a bunch of people who, you have fun with, I think it can be a really good experience. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Brian, sorry, go for it. Oh, I just wanted to offer another resource. Uh, Rue Map, uh, who's based here in Oakland, started an organization, Outdoor Afro, and they also have a nationwide network in the, in the U.S., and they're doing some brilliant work in, you know, really taking up space and providing opportunities for uh, more season, um, you know, outdoor enthusiasts to connect with um, novices. And so I would say definitely look uh, them up. And then uh, there's this, this brilliant brother, Rashad Frazier, who's in Portland, and he has this whole um, project or I guess company now, Yoshi Jenkins. And, you know, I, I, I like what he's doing because he creates these uh, more, I guess, um, I'll, I'll say in lieu of other words, fancy outdoor experiences where he's bringing people out and people are making gourmet food and it's all black folks. And, and I just think that um, they're doing a great work, but we need more. And if people have the initiative, I would say start small groups, like Alexa said, find uh, like-minded people and um, let's just continue revving up this movement. Gorgeous. Yeah, and for anyone listening in from London, there is also, I think we've got our own iteration of Black Girls Camping, which is called Black Girls Camping Trip. Um, and I saw some videos from this year and it looked really, really fun. Um, and yeah, suddenly like they do it rain or shine. There's like a, a thing on the website that's just like, it's still happening if it's raining guys. And I was yep. like, ah. Okay. <laughs> um, so Alexis, this one is specifically for you. Um, and it's very specific. And I'm also interested to know the answer to it. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> I, think you'll, I think you'll know the answer. Um, do chestnuts have to drop from a tree before they're edible? Someone would, would like to know. Okay, so we are late enough in the season that if you give a chestnut branch a shake and the whole husk falls out without opening, those guys are good to go. The shells on those chestnuts are definitely at least 90% of the way formed and you should be great. At least if you're in Ohio, we are now safely out of the early nut drop stage for most of our trees where the trees just like yeet all of the nuts that didn't <laughs> form properly or have gotten eaten by bugs. I'm pretty, oh my gosh, Rory, I'm so sorry that you just had to sign yeet. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> so we, at least here in zone six, we are in the clear. And I believe in zone seven, you guys start getting your nuts dropping before we do. That's a weird phrase to say. Y you should be good to harvest chestnuts now. That's the TLDR answer to your Amazing. question. Amazing. And also chestnuts are a really good camping snack as well. They are. Wrap them up in some foil. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. 
Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the song literally says it. Um, <laughs> I don't think any of you guys, correct me if I'm wrong, are based in, in, in NYC, but um, Scott Megan asks, can you suggest some black owned farm to table restaurants in NYC? I don't know if anyone knows any or in your local area, if, if that's um, more applicable. They've got their thinking faces on. <laughs> Maybe we'll come back to this one. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. OK, cool. Um, so CMHOB525 says, I work for a Brooklyn school, Robert Field School, committed specifically to both equity and inclusion and nurturing children's innate connection to nature. Sounds fantastic. Um, what advice do you have for educators? Um, we'll start with Rahana because you, I mean, presumably you're still from you on what you would have liked to have seen in school um, around connection to nature, education. Oh, sorry, I think I cut out there, apologies. So the, the question was, what advice do you have for educators around connecting children to nature? Yeah, um, I think one of my biggest pieces of advice for educators who want to connect children to nature, especially to eating food, is to give options. I feel like when you're kind of uh, told to, oh, you should make the salad and eat the whole thing, you know, give them options of, oh, we're going to do different types of dressing or different toppings and different greens that you can choose from. And in the past, um, that's really worked out for me. And I had a whole group of elementary school kids, like 20, all eating like a bunch of salad because they had a salad eating competition <laughs> or a salad making competition. So I think give options and make it fun. Yeah, and if I could chime in on this one, because I went to a Montessori school that was also very outdoor education focused um, while I was in elementary school, giving, uh, one, giving kids the time to like be outside and be curious about their surroundings is super important. Um, we had a 45 minute recess. I'm gonna say that that had something to do with how outdoorsy I am. And they would just like let us loose on the woods. We would build forts in the trees. Actually, I think my elementary school makes you call them huts now because forts is a bit too aggressive, uh, uh, a choice yeah. of words, which honestly, great choice by them. <laughs> and uh, second is start teaching them about different plants young. I think we have this like really big misconception that it's not until you're kind of like an academia age that you can start learning about your surroundings, start learning about different plants. But I honestly think that teaching kids, whether it's about the plants you're finding in the kitchen in the grocery store or the plants that you're finding outside, starting them early like you would start a kid early with a language helps form those neural pathways and helps them recognize those things much more easily as they move through life. Um, I know when I was a kid, there was like a mint plant we were all obsessed with at school. And every day we were allowed to eat one mint leaf because we didn't want to kill the plant, but we did still want to enjoy it. Um, and we slowly got to learn all the other herbs in the garden and their similarities and their differences. And you think kids aren't retaining that, but they definitely are. I, I just want to offer um, a, a quick response to that. Um, and I think whether it, it's um, addressing, you know, eating more healthfully or being in the natural environment, I think oftentimes, you know, there's this whole thing where we kind of blame the victim or we just, you know, put a lot of emphasis on individual um, initiative and personal responsibility. And I think that it's important for educators as early as possible to talk about history, to talk about structural barriers that prevent people from accessing or eating good food or that prevent people or make people anxious about being outside. Because I think people, we just have to have a honesty in our curriculum. And I think it's, it's, it's dishonest and it's incomplete when you just say to someone, well, if you just try hard, if you just eat healthfully, or if you just like, you know, knuckle up and pull up your bootstraps, this is a classic conservative argument. And I just, think that um, it's, it's important to teachers give the full picture and then, you know, people can make the most informed, children, students can make the most informed decisions, you know, based on that. Yeah. And Brian, I was reading actually earlier today about how you teach your own children about food and, and nature and the outdoors. Is, has, has, has anything changed or been different during the pandemic time as well when you've been spending more time at home and how you've like tried to educate them or I'm curious to know. 
Uh, you know, when they were doing shelter in place, I think that really pushed us to pay attention more to our garden because in, in the you know midst of the school year with, you know, drop off, pick up, enrichment classes, sports activities, sometimes we can, uh, we don't pay enough attention to our gardens, but it's been great just really giving a lot of attention and, and giving them a lot of agency over what we're growing and um, how it's being grown and, and how we prepare it. And, um, you know, yeah, it's been fun having them cook more and giving us a break. <laughs> <laughs> to the kitchen. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, and one last question for you from Ada Latifa, who asks, "How do you overcome disappointments and failure?" And I guess we can we can make that specifically about you know your work in in, in the food space. Um, Alexis, do you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. Mm, I know, speaking from a foraging standpoint, there are fewer things that are more heartbreaking than taking the time to gather something, process something, go through all of the steps that you thought were necessary to make something, and then often many days later, not have it turn out the way that you want it to. Um, but there's also something really humbling about it. I. I'm a wallower. I'm just going to say that right now. When I when things like that happen to me, I'm definitely the kind of person who's just like, well, today is over. We're putting on a sad movie. I'm buying some vegan ice cream and we are calling today a day. Um, so I guess the way that I deal with it is by like feeling that disappointment, but making the in, the decision the next day to try again. That's like the biggest thing for me. Never squish those feelings. Never try and mute those feelings. That's not healthy. Be disappointed. Like be upset about the time that you feel like you lost, but don't let it keep you from trying that thing again. Um, that is speaking directly from the three times it took me to try to get uh, my acorn jelly, my Dottori muck to set last year. I cried <laughs> multiple times. <laughs> oh, bless you. Um, okay, that's, that's, that's amazing. Um, maybe just to end on a, on a more jo joyful note, and also because I secretly want to get a recipe out of at least one of you guys on this call. Like, I need some, like, tips on how to cook some stuff. Um, Rohana, like, what are you cooking at the moment? What, what should we be cooking in our homes at the moment that's sort of seasonal and easy and fresh and good? Like, what can we make? Yeah, I mean, I've been cooking a lot recently. Um, right now, figs are kind of at the end of their season and they're really, really good. I'll talk about figs all day because I love them so much. <laughs> and I just love to eat them with jelly on toast. And you can just mm. like cook them down with a little bit of um, lemon juice and sugar or some type of sweetener, maybe maple, or even dates and, you know, make a really good preserve. Gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Brian, I can see you're nodding your head vigorously at that. Is any other recipes for figs in the back of your mind? <laughs> oh my God, we just made a ginger fig jam for from mm. this um, 300 year old fig tree that um, we have on, um, on one of our properties. And yeah, figs all day. I'm, I look, I coast, look, figs. You West Coast kid <laughs> and your fig trees, it's not fair. <laughs> Big up the figs. I mean, yeah, I love that. I and I, I've never had it with ginger before, so yeah, that's amazing. Cooking them down, doing it with ginger, I love it. Um, do do okay, we have one then, more minute? Oh, I we're, we're playing it close to the wire, but for okay, you, ten seconds. I just wanted okay. to because this is one of the potential questions that I know we had um, looked at, mm -hmm. and I want to know from Rahana and Alexis, who would be the person with whom you'd love to have as your companion? Yeah. Um, you know, at a meal, just your your dining date. <laughs> Oh my gosh. My answer was like not fair because I know everyone hates it when people say family members who are no longer with us. Um, but it would 100% be my Nana, my Cape Verdean grandmother, uh, who we lost about 10 years ago now. A lot of what I know about food was passed down directly from her. Um, and it really is unfortunate losing a really important member of your family while you're still like kind of a snot-nosed kid. I was like in my early 20s, but mm -hmm. still kind of a snot-nosed kid. So what I wouldn't give to be able to now with all of the additional knowledge I've amassed, mm -hmm. make a meal 
for her and like inevitable snarky comments from her aside just feel like I could give back to her in the way that she had given to me and my parents so much during uh, the course of her life. I would have loved to have taken her foraging too. She would have complained the entire time, um, but she would have loved the food that we gathered that I know. Yeah, I think my answer is pretty similar. I feel like as a Haitian and African-American and indigenous Mexican person, I definitely want to be able to sit down with my ancestors and just talk to them about food and how it's changed over the years and certain family recipes that we had, um, how those ingredients have changed and, you know, just uh, be able to eat really good food. Thank you. Oh, that's such Brian, a good idea. Brian, what about you? You can't dodge the question. <laughs> yeah, you, have to, you have to answer the question now. <laughs> um, the late rapper MF Doom is down. I would love to, um, just, he's my favorite rapper, but he also uh, emphasized food a lot in his work. Like he has uh, five or six vo volumes of beats that he makes and all of the beats are named after different herbs. They're called fresh herbs. And he has a whole album called mm, Food, so. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much, guys. Um, and thank you to everyone else for joining us. Stay tuned for a special presentation from Precious Okoyomon uh, shortly. Today I wake up, still the assemblage, associated distortions bewilder me. In this world, I am a shapeshifter. Fragmented body perceptions as higher vibration frequencies to God. In the supernatural sky, I was restful as I had reached my place of salvation. The surface is material structure, neither heaven nor solace, only the wind, only quenched light, lulled into covering until everything was the same soul object, well formed in the irreducible, always already truth hidden in the trees. It is nothing. I'm here, I am still here, desire dissolves away. I drink gulps of light, putting myself back together. The rain pushes the glyphosate and polyacidric hydrocarbons down into the ground. The industrial operation rehearses suffering. It moves me, the world with terrible momentum shift me into dimensional alienation, construct an object already weaponized within the Surface is the loss of what is already missing within. I look up at the sky bathed in pink, longing for a liberated psyche. I wish I could rinse of any meaning into light, no former shape, like the world is dying, the world is dying in flames, like rapacious gloom in the empire's burning afterlife, like looking out the window, a hollow flower, like falling into the wind, like falling into heavy air, like falling into limitless love, like made into the membrane of that real high shit, like pathogenic pleasure, like we gotta make a new world, like fade up, open association, vacate, reframe, like the surprising sun is blossoming somewhere and I'm here blown away into the paradox of smiling. Now to close us out, singer, rapper, songwriter, activist, and workshop facilitator who's been described as a spiritual experience. If you've seen her Tiny Desk concert, you know. If you haven't, you're in for a treat. Please welcome Moo Moo Fresh. This song is called Love Me Now. And it's a story about not taking for granted the love that we have, not just for each other, but also the love that the earth shows us and allowing us to be sustained here on planet earth as humans. And sometimes we feel like we'll always have clean air and always have clean water, but not if we abuse that love that the earth gives to us. And it's the same in our own relationships between humans. You have to take care of those things that are precious, that are valuable, that are irreplaceable, like love is. And when you have it, don't wait. Hold on to it in love now. Ba -ba 
about if we are the ones the ones we've had visions of and all the prophets prophecies were of us spawned from the same source we've loved so many times before so for one last time take I'm yours, yeah. Love is infinite, time has a starting end. For the stars fall down, oceans rise again. Take this moment in, love me now. Before the moon descends and the horizon ends, over tribes of men and the righteous win. Take this moment in. Love me now and love me now. Don't wait until tomorrow. This time we have is borrowed in love. Till tomorrow, this time we have is borrowed. Love me now. When the sun consumes the earth and it gives birth to a new universe, the first shall be last and the last shall be first purify the sins of man take away the curse cause love is infinite time has a starting end before the stars fall down oceans rise again take this moment in love me now yeah. before the moon descends and the horizon ends over tribes of men and the righteous win. I take this moment in. Love me now. And love me now. Don't wait until tomorrow. This time we have to borrow. Love me now. And love Till tomorrow, this time we have is borrowed. Love me now. Ba ba da ba 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 da ba 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 Every ounce of your love on display. Don't let the minor take the major place. Surrender all will be swept away. Tomorrow may be too late. And love me now. Don't wait until tomorrow. The time we have is borrowed. Wait 
wait until tomorrow. The time we have is borrowed, yeah. And love me now. Don't wait until tomorrow. This time we have is borrowed. Love me, love me, love me now. Don't wait until tomorrow. The time we have is borrowed. You love me now. Don't wait until tomorrow. This time we have is borrowed. Love me now. A warm thank you to Mumu Fresh for gifting us with your voice and song. It was an incredible performance and that song will be stuck in my head forever, I think. <laughs> Me too. Thank you to every single person that contributed to the program today and each of you watching along with us. We're so glad that you were here. We also want to extend love and appreciation to our community partners. This program will be viewable at any time right here on YouTube and you can explore more about the series, including articles, interactive experiences, and more at nytimes.com slash BHC. We will see you outside. <laughs>